Good evening, everyone. And welcome to this session this evening entitled Carbon Pricing and Economic Growth that is jointly sponsored by iPolitics and the Ecofiscal Commu uh, Commission in, uh, in Montreal at McGill University. My name is Tom Peterson. I'm the chair of the board of the Canadian Climate Forum, and it is with great pleasure tonight that I welcome you to this. This event is being held in conjunction with the two-day symposium that the Canadian Climate Forum is running on moving towards sustainable energy. And, of course, carbon pricing is such a key consideration if we are indeed, as a society, to realize the dream of having sustainable energy. You know, when you think about getting our greenhouse gas emissions down, we have a toolbox that has multiple tools in it. A carbon price is one tool. Regulations are another. Standards are another. Human behavioral change, as induced by these things, is another. But if we fail to act on getting our emissions down, the costs are extraordinary. I come from British Columbia. I'm at the University of Victoria. And I've watched our interior forests in British Columbia essentially die in very large amounts starting in the early 1990s right up to the present day, thanks to an infestation of the pine bark beetle. All of you will have heard of that. But I think what is not widely known is that we've now lost, or at least had afflicted, 19 million hectares of our pine forests in the interior of British Columbia. That's four times the size of Denmark. We've lost those trees. And the cost to our economy in British Columbia has been in excess of $100 billion of commercial pine in excess of $100 billion over the harvest cycle, which is on the order of 50 or 60 years. As a direct result of that, we've closed 24 sawmills in the interior of British Columbia. And if you go to the small towns in the middle of British Columbia, what you find is very high unemployment because global warming allowed the pine bark beetle to thrive. And so that's related directly to our emissions profile as a human society. So we need to get a handle on this. And there are many other examples of costs, and I'm sure some of those will come up in the discussions this evening. The Fort McMurray wildfire, billions of dollars of direct damages. The, hot, the Calgary High River Canmore flood of 2013, something on the order of $6 billion in damages. And on and on the list goes. There are many, many more such examples that we could invoke. So we need, as a society, to be rigorous in our war on greenhouse gas emissions, in bringing those emissions under control. And it is with great pleasure tonight that we'll have, I think, a rollicking good discussion. I hope it'll be a rollicking good discussion on how carbon pricing can factor into that and its impact on economic growth. So I would like to invite the moderator of this evening's discussion to take the podium now. Dr. Chris Reagan is Associate Professor of Economics at McGill University in Montreal and a very effective spokesperson for the Ecofiscal Commission, which I think he is primarily responsible for getting going. So Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to iPolitics and to the Canadian Climate Forum for putting all of this together and for allowing us to have this, what is an eco-fiscal panel. Um, I won't speak too much about the content, except to say that the, the idea behind this panel is to bring together two ideas that are front of center, uh, I think, in the Canadian economic landscape and, frankly, for the Canadian governments across the country. Uh, one is how to achieve improvements in economic growth, why that's important and how to do it. Um, and the second is how best to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. How do the climate policies and the, the, the imperative for economic growth come together? So I'm delighted that um, what we've got here on the panel are people that are um, rather expert at those issues. So on my far left, your right, is Dominic Barton. He's the Global Managing Director of McKinsey and & Company, and he's also an advisor on the advisory board of the Ecofiscal Commission. Tonight, he's going to be wearing the growth and opportunities hat, all right? So he's going to tell you why growth is important, and he's going to tell you about the opportunities that come in a world where we actually uh, really address our climate challenge. Uh, on his right is Paul Booth, 
who is, um, has been many things in the federal government and actually some provincial governments. His la latest position with the federal government was Deputy Minister of the Environment. He knows more than a few things about how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also how not to. Uh, he's also a commissioner on the Ecofiscal Commission, so he's one of the 12 people whose names appear on our reports. The hat he's wearing tonight is how to reduce emissions and how to do it well. And uh, on Paul's right is Elise Allen, who is the head of GE Canada. She is also an advisor on the Ecofiscal Commission. And the hat that she's wearing tonight is innovation. Why innovation might just be the solution to trying to have both growth and uh, lower emissions, but also how to do it and perhaps how not to do it. So with that, I'd like you to welcome my panelists uh, to the panel, and we're going to start. So is my, is my microphone on? OK, so we are actually going to start. We're going to try to keep this conversational. So I'm going to ask hopefully short questions. They're going to give hopefully short answers. We'll keep it snappy, and that way we can keep it conversational. I will just say that um, you can send your questions in in batches of 160 characters or less, or less is important. Um, Slido.com, hashtag iPaulGrowth, and I'm told that that is a different hashtag than what you were using earlier today. So it's a new hashtag, it's a new world. All right? <laughs> so send in your questions. I'm going to start with Dom Barton. Dom, your question is, um, why is there such a need for economic growth, more economic growth in Canada? Well, I think we all know the, can you hear me okay, the, the global situation, the IMF has just uh, dropped global uh, growth rate forecast for the fifth year in a row. Um, we are seeing in Canada um, actually an accentuation of that. We, we've also been dropping our GDP growth rate um, and our GDP per capita growth rate but what's even more worrying is if we play the film forward, uh, because of our, our aging demographics, uh, we're going to have much less workers in the workforce. That's been the biggest driver of our productivity over the last 50 years. It's been workforce growth as opposed to productivity improvement. And when we look at that film, we're going to see a very significant drop off. It's going to go from an average of roughly 3.1%, which it was over the last 50 years, to about 1.5%. And on a GDP per capita basis, it's even worse. So we are, in fact, the fastest aging OECD country in the world, but because basically because Japan's already gone there. They're over the, the cliff on that one. Um, but we're right there. And so we, we need, we, and we're a, you know, as we were talking about today, we're a small cork in the sea uh, with our economy. We, we, need, we need to trade and, and work with other countries and so forth. And what it's going to require is some, I think, some pretty significant actions to be able to, to change the trajectory. I mean, the good news is there are things we can do, but it, it won't, you know, the fruit won't fall from the tree. We, we're going to have to work at it uh, to drive it. Um, and that's, you know, if, so if we don't focus on growth, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a very dismal uh, situation. And the, the good news is we actually can do something about it, but if we don't, it's not going to be very pleasant. So the first 55 seconds of his one-minute answer was fairly negative. <laughs> but but we're going we're to come to the positive stuff soon. Paul, um, the need to reduce emissions, we've heard a bit about, um, but also how to do it well. What's, I mean, again, not too much in the detail, but how to do it well. Well, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Tom did a good job of giving an, an example of um, the need for, for reducing emissions. And, uh, you know, we have financial estimates. The, um, the uh, National Roundtable produced an estimate back in, in 2010, I think, which had uh, the cost in the $50 billion per year range uh, to Canada if we did not address these problems when you try to add all those things up. but. Um, and, and you know, when it comes to what we, we need to do, we need to do, and you've heard this from, from different people during this conference, we need to do everything. Um, and uh, I was, a, I was a, a, a regulator at Environment Canada. We need some regulations. We need good regulations. 
Uh, but the other thing, one of the other important things we need is, is carbon pricing. And, and before I get into the details of that later in our, our talk, I just wanted to say, you know, whatever we do, we want to try to find the lowest cost way of our achieving our targets. And we should be looking at, uh, at that. And, you know, some people say, oh, well, it, it's too expensive. We shouldn't do this. It's too expensive. So I just started to think about this. Say Canada had emissions of about 730 million tons a year, which it actually does. And suppose that, suppose that we put a price of $30 on each one of those tons. Well, that would be about $22 billion a year. It's a lot of money. But when you compare it to Canada's GDP, which is $2 trillion, it's about 1%, right? Not the growth rate of GDP, 1% of the level of GDP. So if we put on a carbon tax or cap and trade or something, did a bunch of things and got a $30 cost, and we took that money and we threw it into the ocean, it would call, cost us 1% of GDP. So, you know, I think, I think we have to put this in context. My, uh, my, my pine beetle story is actually, uh, pine beetle moment was actually in northern Canada. The first time that I went to Inuvik and saw all the buildings on stilts, you know, because of the permafrost, and they're tipping over. There's a high school in Inuvik that they built, and they g never got to move into because it cracked in half. So that money was completely wasted, right? If you want to know what climate change is doing to Canada, the, uh, the quickest way to find out is to go into the north. So um, is it expensive? Yes. Relative to our overall uh, annual production? No. And uh, however we go about this, we should be looking at being as efficient and effective as possible. Two quick things before we go to lease. Number one, I'm pretty sure that he's not recommending that we actually put a price on carbon, take the money and throw it in the ocean, <laughs> okay? But we'll come back to that because actually what you do with the revenue matters. So we'll come back to that. The other thing is notice he just did a very quick and dirty back of the envelope calculation and said it would basically cost 1% of GDP. Now the Ecofiscal Commission, on which he sits, also wrote a 20 page report. And after a lot of thinking and a lot of modeling, we came up with the same answer. So what does that say? I, th I, think, I think it's an argument for doing precise research. OK, um, Elise, um, so we need growth. Uh, we need to reduce emissions. Um, somewhere in here, I'm guessing there's going to be a pretty serious change of the way we do things in life. Right our energy system. So innovation, right. what role does that have to play? So first of all, I think we know that innovation is something that's hard because it's all about change. And most people, for the most part, find life is easier if you keep things more status quo than change. So the idea of investing in new things, changing our processes, creating new ideas, reallocating capital, all those things work against the idea of innovation. And so when we need growth, though, we have sort of an imperative that says, how do we do it? And there are other ways people might drive growth, not necessarily always through innovation. But what is really sometimes a barrier is when the economics don't work. Now we have two things that have happened with carbon pricing. One is we have the establishment of metrics, a goal, something that people can be driving for. And the second thing is, we have an economic reason right, to start to look at innovation. And what's exciting about innovation in this sector is A, it addresses a growth challenge that we are having. B, we have the capacity to innovate because we happen to be in a country that has this wonderfully highly educated workforce, tons of engineers and skilled trades. So we have all the ingredients that go in but we haven't had that economic motivation that helped make the calculations right. So when it was hard, and you didn't have the metrics driving you. So what's very exciting now is that we have all the pieces we need to actually be this incredibly innovative 
society. And on top of it, we now have both a goal and a change in the economic equation that can help create the impetus to actually drive innovation. With that comes the ability to test and pilot things here on real problems that we have where innovation will give us a solution, but problems that other people in the world have too. And if we can design them here, test them against our problems and figure them out, then we have this tremendous ability to scale them and export these technologies and our know-how and our capabilities globally. So I mean, it's just this fantastic win that, in, that you know, in some ways we've been, many of us have been calling for for some time, and the pieces are coming together now to actually drive uh, growth, drive exports, drive creativity that we have the capability to do, um, and to develop these new solutions for the marketplace and for the world. Okay, great. So I'm going to start digging into some of these details. So I'm going to tell you what your next question is going to be, so some of you get a little time to think about it. So uh, the first question is going to go to Paul, and the question is, why pricing? You mentioned good regulations. Presumably that means there are bad regulations. <clears throat> so how does pricing work, and why is it sometimes better than regulations, and why is it sometimes perhaps not as good as regulations? That's going to be your question, and you're going to be first. The second is going to be to Dom, and it's going to be, what sort of opportunities might we see in a world with carbon pricing? If we say, started at $30 and moved up, what sort of opportunities are created? And Elise, I want you to come back to innovation and tell us, kind of, like, you live and work in a very innovative industry and an innovative company. But innovation is this big, nebulous word. So what, is, what are some tangible examples of innovation, and then connect that to carbon pricing, okay? So, Paul, you're first. Why, car how does par carbon pricing work, and how does it connect to regulations? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, you know, as I said, I mean, uh, in a former life, I was an environmental regulator, and there are definitely situations where regulation is the best approach. Um, I mean, you have to look at it case by case. But I guess the reason that um, EcoFiscal is really focused on carbon pricing is because um, setting a price of carbon does uh, a number of things. First of all, it sends a clear signal across the uh, economy, and it tells people um, that uh, they need to change their behavior. Something previously free, now it's costly, we're going to change our behavior. So how do we respond? How does it actually work? So let think, think about transportation. Think about driving. So, you know, there's a number of things you can do. At one end, you can buy an EV, right? And so I was in this great session talking about electric vehicles early, earlier on today. But at the other end, you could reorganize your Saturday shopping trips to do your shopping in one trip instead of three trips. Right? And so you have a range of options, and you will uh, employ those options uh, up to the point that, that it's worth it to you, to you to do that savings. But actually, there's a bit of a surprise in, in carbon pricing that <clears throat> economists weren't really ready for. And it came out in the research that was done on the carbon tax in, in, in British Columbia. And some people have called that salience. And that is, just getting people thinking about carbon has a positive impact on their behavior. And the way we saw this in BC was, you know, economists have demand curves and they say, well, if we put a tax on, it'll reduce demand by this much. And actually, what we saw was that demand was reduced by more than we expected. And, you know, the, the, the explanation of this seems to be that it's simply the fact that people in BC were thinking more about carbon and how can I reduce carbon. I can tell you, my wife, uh, we, have, we have peak load pricing for electricity in, uh, in Ontario now. And my wife wants me to stay up until 11 o'clock to turn the dryer on. So this, this caused me, I can't stay up till 11 o'clock, that's too late for me. So that caused me to buy a new dryer with a timer so that I could take into account uh, peak load pricing. The thing is that, you know, I mean, I could probably afford 
to run my dryer at uh, supper time, but it's just being aware of this starts to change behavior, and that is what's going to reduce emissions. Ultimately, we're trying to find the most efficient way to change behavior. So we're going to come back later to how climate policy can be a source of marital discord. <laughs> um, but your next question, Paul, is going to be to tell us about a bad regulation and what is it that makes it bad? Because I really want people to understand that you're talking about flexibility in there's something about a market flexibility in a carbon price that I think bad regulations, in your view, won't have. So now we're going to, I think, Dom, for... Um, uh, in a world of carbon pricing, what kind of opportunities? Because we're used to talking about this as a negative issue, as we have a problem that we need to solve. But how about the opportunities? Yeah, I think there's very significant opportunities. And I'll come back to something that Elise said about, you know, we have a goal and a price. And I, I think, you know, one should never, ever underestimate the power of price and what uh, as a signal. And, and on many dimensions, um, you mentioned it on consumer behavior, which I think is... We, it, it's, we, need to ha we need to have true costs in, in the system or we're going to allocate our resources in a very poor way. Where the growth aspect comes in, my view, is two parts. One is we should be investing a lot more money in R&D, clean tech. I mean, Canada should be a leader in clean tech. Why is it Germany? Why, 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 why is it China? I, we, we should be leading that. I think part of it is when we don't price it, there's no incentive uh, for being able to do it. And I think, it, I think actually one of the many benefits of carbon pricing is it's going to unleash more R&D uh, that is going to go in because we, you therefore have to look for more efficient ways of dealing uh, with, with the costs and what things are going to happen over time. So I think we'll see more R&D uh, being put into it. Second, actually, with investors. You know, investors, pension funds, which are some of the most long-term investors, they care about ESG not because it, it was politically correct, but because when you own an asset for 60 to 100 years, you do work, you, you, you realize what happens when the pine beetle uh, comes in. And so, and so you demand um, performance on those, those categories. And I think having pricing, if we can then reallocate other investment resources behind that, I think we're also going to see um, opportunities where people are going to say we should be you know, developing these types of energy systems, the innovation in power grids and so forth. The final one I'd just say back to the consumer is, you know, we, you, there's the carbon cost curve, which I think we should all look at. And when we actually, there are so many opportuni business opportunities. There are very large businesses that are being created in the world. Schneider Electric is a classic one. It is all built around environmental controls, helping the home operate better, helping businesses operate better in terms of how they use their, their energies. There's many, so there's many big businesses to actually be built from this. So I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really important uh, signal uh, that will lead to resource allocation into the right things and actually create jobs. Um, and I just find that it, it, by not having it, we will be missing an action uh, compared to other parts of the world that, that, that are putting it in place. Obviously well, we the have world to, is yeah. certainly going in that direction, yeah. so there are opportunities. Yeah. So you mentioned something, and I want to bring it back, actually, yeah. something you said to a question for everybody, which is going to be after a few more, but it's, it's about your statement about uh, the need to or the desire to invest in clean tech, so I'm going to come back to that. And, Paul, we're coming back to you for an example of a bad regulation, but now we're on a lease on tangible examples of innovation, what it really means to the normal person who doesn't live in your world, uh, and how that connects to carbon pricing. Okay. So if, let's go back to the idea of awareness. So 15 years ago, if you were to be polling Canadians, I think it was about 15, and North Americans and many places, other places in the world, environment, caring for the environment, taking environmental change was like number one in all the polling. And so as a company that invents things, we started saying, well, let's come out with the better light bulb. Let's come out with a more efficient gas engine. Let's work on a new type of locomotive. And we can make a conscious decision to start to innovate. We start investing um, into new products or expanded products, more efficient products. What we found, though, is that 15 years ago, when we came out with something that was more green, 
just more green. And because we had just spent money to invest this new product, we obviously are pricing it a bit higher than what's on the shelf today because it's new and we're trying to get some money back for the investment that I don't think people, but at the time, people weren't willing to pay. As much as they voted environment and being green as number one in the polling, if you were to ask many different suppliers who made that type of equipment, you couldn't sell it because people weren't willing to switch and pay more to be green, even though they wanted us all to be green. So we created something. We said, how do we make this work? And so I'm telling you a story to answer your question. What we said is, is there a way that we can create the way for them to pay for it? Because here we are trying to innovate. The natural economics, do not they're not doing it just because of awareness or because they want to be green. There's too big a gap. So we started to innovate further and say, if that light bulb gives you a payback in a reasonable but bit of time, will you change to that new light bulb in your house or perhaps in your warehouse or in your factory if you get a reasonable two or three year payback? Otherwise, the business person didn't want to change out the lighting that they already had because they could put that capital somewhere else. So we started taking a list of products where we thought we could be innovative and green and say, how do we now improve the efficiency so that the return on the product is above and beyond what you might have gotten and in fact gives you a way to pay for being green. So you pay for being green and you have a little bit of change still left in your pocket. We drove that innovation through our engineering teams. 11 years later, we have sold $112 billion of new, innovative, creative equipment around the world. Internally, we have improved our GHG emissions 32% and our water consumption was reduced by 45%. Why? Because suddenly there was this drive for innovation. We figured out a way to make the economics work through efficiency and new creativity, but we're also limited in terms of how much you can make that work. Now we have a market structure that enables that to happen in a much broader and bigger way. We took a big bet, and we never thought it would have played out the way it did for us. Um, and so we were able to keep going on it. Now we have the capacity that the market will work that way and drive that type of innovation. So when you have, let's take the oil and gas industry, and let's assume pricing had stayed you know, the way it was. Everybody was very busy. Right? And mining, same thing when commodities were high, they're very busy. They don't want to take time to stop, change out things, and innovate because they need things working smoothly because it's about flow. It's a flow business. So here now, all of a sudden you have economics that build into the regular operating, and they say, wow, it pays to, it, it makes sense to be innovating because we can fit it in, we can drive the change in the course of our business. Of course, with low commodities, there's that much more time now to try and drive this because you don't have that same um, activity level so they have time to breathe and test innovation. So that's all incredibly positive for us. And the result that we are seeing is we created an innovation center, for example, for energy. And whereas we were having to go to the customers and push, they are now walking in saying, help me innovate on this, help me innovate on that. How do I reduce my emissions here? What else can we do over here? And I'm sure you heard a little bit about that with some of your other speakers this morning, but it has become a major incentive now to do more than they already were doing because the economics are that much more also compelling. And of course, we have the, a little bit more time now in the sense of where the industry is. But that's the innovation can be very real, and it drives very tangible results. Paul, with your permission, I'm going to stay on the innovation theme for a bit. So I want to come back to Dom's question, point about clean tech and investing in clean tech. So you know, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of debate uh, among uh, people who are thinking about these policies about how much we need to uh, invest in clean tech, and I'm talking about public money, 
Um, so some people say we need to actually devote public resources to investing in clean tech so that we can develop uh, those low carbon alternatives and we can ease this transition to a low carbon world. Other people will argue that if you put a carbon price in place and it's a broad based carbon price of $30 per ton and it ramps up to $50 and $70, then that is, that's the incentive you need, right? That's the thing that will drive that clean tech and that innovation. So do you have views? And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for just a little bit of disagreement here because it's always fun. Okay, but do we have any disagreement here, any views here on, you know, do we need to directly support clean tech and things like that, or can we allow the carbon price to do the heavy lifting? When I speak to some clean tech venture capitalists and I ask them, what is the number one way to energize their business model, their answer is a carbon price. So does any, do you have a view on that? I'll take a view and someone can argue just for the sake of the argument. So <laughs> a, car a carbon price is a great incentive, but the fact is as, until it ramps up, it's at a certain level. And our clean tech, I would say that if you can do more, that helps too. It only helps because it gives us a bit of an edge. And on some equipment, you have a lot, you might have capital that has a 20 year life. Um, and so you kind of say, how am I, I'm not going to, change out this 20 year life capital equipment because it's got another 20 years so how do how do we change it and we're dealing with that with coal plants out you know in Calgary in in you know across the country so that's a challenge because you say okay we've invested in this how do we do this in a smart way everybody wants to have you know so that we all win right the environment okay, wins so this, that means so the that, support so, so the port for the you? clean tech might actually be transitional until the until carbon it, price gets until, high right. enough to, to drive it. Right. And so you have well, to kick and it And then out. I'd like to wonder how we actually do the clean tech investment of public funds in a way that doesn't become politicized, that doesn't become a, a, you know, a black hole of money. Either of you two. Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to take this opportunity to, to answer with a response about regulation. Oh, wow. excellent. Oh, because I, I think sometimes you know, um, sometimes you've got to say that regulation is the best way to do, do, do it. So let me give you an example. Regulation, for example, sometimes it's very helpful because you need to coordinate things. So um, fuel economy standards regulation that was passed when I was uh, at Environment Canada and um, lines up exactly with the, uh, with the fuel economy standards in the U.S., right? So because we sell so much of our product, our autos to the U.S., and we buy so much from the U.S., it makes a lot of sense to have, you know, parallel regulations so that that trade cannot, that those in the environmental differences don't spring up and become a barrier to trade. So that's a situation where, you know, if we had a carbon price of something and the U.S. did not or had a different carbon price, or maybe their population just responded, it, responded to it a little bit differently, w suddenly good environmental policy would be bad trade policy. So, I mean, you have to think about these things in terms of the whole picture. And here is where uh, environmental regulation in parallel with our largest market made a lot of sense. You know, the only thing I, I would say is I'd be more for not having the government do it and have the price, the, you know, using the pricing system to do it. The only areas where, where I think the government could play a, a big role is, is kind of like the DARPA equivalent. Mm -hmm. So there's some very big projects, uh, you know, carbon sequestration, how that is one company can't, you know, that, that's a moonshot, right? That, that may take multiple countries working together. And I, I think that there, you know, there again, it may not be so much even the capital, but the commitment. It, it's a, a, a war on climate change, if I might call it that. And then putting in the, the long-term, the, the research money, as opposed to the capital. Because I also worry about subsidies. We, we've seen, I think it's mixed. I mean, you, you guys may have, you'll have a better view than me, but I'm, where people have tried on the solar side to do things, you get, you get a massive expansion and then massive bankruptcies that, that occur. So I'd, be, I'd want to be careful with that, but, there, but, but the idea of having a, you know, Canada having a center of excellence or several of them in, in this area, DARPA-like, where 
businesses that are gonna, would be nearby, uni the universities, you have some sort of a system. I think it could generate an incredible number of you know, businesses that could be startups that would come through it in the digital data right. side of things. So I'd be more focused on our, that type of an investment as opposed to big capital. Great, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back and connect right to that idea. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask about revenue recycling. Let's suppose we're in a world of a carbon price. The carbon price ramps up over time. Uh, that carbon price will rise proportionately faster than emissions will fall, so total revenues will rise, almost certainly, for the next 15 years. Um, now what to do with the revenues? So a shameless bit of advertising for the Ecofiscal Commission. Uh, back in the spring of this year, we wrote a report called Choose Wisely, which is all about how governments that are carbon pricing uh, can think about how to recycle those revenues. And you know, the, the choose wisely is kind of the advice, is that it, this isn't simple. There, you, there's a bunch of objectives you have as a government, uh, and there's a bunch of ways that you can recycle that revenue, and there's no one way that's gonna hit all of your objectives. So just to connect to, to growth, um, you know, economists, or many economists, believe that the most growth-retarding tax we have ever created is a corporate income tax. So some economists will say, well, what you should do is take your carbon pricing revenues, and if you really, really care about growth, what you should do is use those revenues to reduce corporate income taxes, or maybe personal income taxes as well, and get the boost from growth on that. But others are gonna have different views. Um, so BC has a legislatively guaranteed revenue neutral carbon price. Ontario is carbon pricing now without that sort of guarantee. Same thing in, in Alberta and same thing in Quebec. So let me ask the three of you, what is your, uh, if, if you have the ear of a prime minister or a finance minister, uh, oh, some of you do, um, what is your recommended way to, and ways, plural, to recycle carbon pricing revenue if you are being mindful about growth? but also about innovation and the need to make this transition. I was going to say wearing an innovation hat. Um, <laughs> I, would innovation. Put, I would put forward the hypothesis that we should put those revenues to facilitate this innovation and drive sort of the investments in technology because some of this, the fact is, it's hard and tough stuff. Um, particularly in some of these energy spaces, some of these heavy um, different types of um, manufacturing environments or process environments. Um, and so the ability to really test out how to do this, whether it's um, how do we innovate about actually using the carbon, how we talk about sequestering, to your point earlier, how we, I mean, it's, it's not that the answers are sitting there just ready to kind of come off the shelf, it actually takes time and it takes engineering and it takes investment in capital. So we do, do we have a machine in Canada, whether it's provincial or federal, that actually facilitates innovate? Like does SBTC yeah, there, do a good job? Yeah, there are, there are a number of them um, and they all approach it in little different ways. We've worked uh, for many years with SDDC at the federal level um, where they do a call you know, for sort of ideas and they ask you to work with SMEs and local companies. So it's had, I think, you know, we always thought it was a very, very good model. You also have in, in Alberta, I think the name has changed, but the CCEMC, <coughs> they have put out challenges to the world um, with um, million dollar awards um, where about using carbon and how you might um, uh, capture or use carbon. Um, and so that actually challenge is going around right now and they've ru run several of them for a number of years. So I think we have had some good examples of how to do that. Okay, great. Dom, you're... I'd be more on the revenue neutral, at least until the rest of the world is... Like I would say, I'm where Elise is, once more people do it, what I... What I uh, what I, one of the things I like about British Columbia is that that, from a if you're a corporate in there, you know I, I think we, we want to change behaviors, but I think we have to be careful about how competitive we are um, with people that are not doing it right and in, in, in where it is. And I and so that's the only thing I, I but I'm not an I don't wanna, I'm not a deep expert in this. But that's just my sense. And then it, once people are moving, and I think it's really important, and I'm very happy we do have, we will put carbon pricing in. I think it's very important, but we've also got to, let's, let's get everyone 
excited about being in that program and then figure out how we can reallocate it. I, I would actually think again, but that doesn't mean I don't think we should be using some of the budget for this DARPA type stuff, right? right? That separate from what, right. where it's sure. coming from. Can okay. I do a rebuttal on that or a thought? Mm -hmm. You want a conversation? Well, you should ask Paul. <laughs> oh, can I? Yeah, respond? please jump in and then I will too. <laughs> yeah. So one thing I just was thinking about, I think one difference is that the going back into tax neutral, and help me here if this is the right way that's applied, but if you're a small business or a startup business or just you may not have taxes that that benefits. And one of the advantages of at least putting some of it back into the innovation agenda is that then actually feeds back into accelerators, small businesses that have great technology that are trying to grow. It might help pay for piloting and for commercialization of great technologies that we just haven't been able to get either out of the you know academic labs or you know out of the you know out of corporate shell you know or off the shelf. So maybe it's some combination of of both, but not everybody benefits from the taxes. Um, but we sure get a lot of potential growth and new formation, hopefully company formation through commercialization, which would come from funding and catalyzing our innovation agenda. Okay, Paul's uh, favorite recycling method, and then we're going to turn it over to questions that are starting to appear on our screen. And we are going to be very democratic in how we do that. Okay. Except periodically we'll be <laughs> dictatorial. <laughs> well, I definitely wouldn't put it in the ocean. <laughs> because Excellent. that would be against the Fisheries Act. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I have sworn in to uphold the Fisheries Act. But, uh, but I think the other angle that we have to introduce into this is fairness. Right? And that is, if we just have carbon pricing right across the economy, that is, you know, may fall more heavily on lower income folks than higher income folks. Yeah. So when we think about recycling this money, we should make sure that uh, one of the things that we're not doing is putting too big a burden on, um, on lower income folks. I guess I would say that I'm supportive of taking some piece of it and supporting innovation. But um, I, I have to say, you know, uh, if, it's, uh, if it works, don't, uh, don't change it. And the, the, uh, the experience that we have from British Columbia is, is pretty compelling. So I wouldn't take too big a piece of it. And uh, when I was doing I for, to support nice. innovation, I nice. uh, yeah, yeah, I am nice. Diplomat. I, yeah. I am a diplomat. And, um, but I, I, certainly think, anymore, you know, I but. certainly think that we have to think about this whole business of fairness when we're talking about recycling these revenues. Yeah. Uh, Do you on, have a view? On the, I, 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 <laughs> thank you for asking. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. So um, uh, comment on Paul's comment about low income. Um, one of the things you'll notice about Alberta's uh, evolving system um, is that they are committed to returning some chunk of the carbon pricing revenues to the lowest, I think it's 60%, of households by income. So they are w turning what would otherwise be a regressive carbon tax into a very progressive tax plus redistribution policy. And that's one thing you can do. The other comment I will make is that there is a, t uh, so, so Dom talked about revenue neutrality to enhance competitiveness. And I think what he had in mind is using the revenues to reduce corporate income tax because that would help competitiveness. So here is a bit of an irony here. British Columbia has used the revenues to reduce their personal and their corporate income tax, but their, their commitment to having it revenue neutral has prevented them from doing industry-specific carve-outs to address the real competitiveness challenges in the emissions-intensive sector. And, so, and that has, I think, uh, provided a challenge for the government in BC in terms of raising the price. Because then you get the business community saying, well, we actually need you to pay attention to this competitiveness issue. It just so happens that the Ecofiscal Commission has written a report on this. <laughs> uh, so go back, and it's, it's, it's there, because it shows which industries in which provinces are particularly challenged. But there are solutions. I'm going to, um, I'm going to come to the questions. And I hope you will take a look at the questions up on the screen, uh, hashtag iPaulGrowth. And you get to vote on these questions. And as you vote on these questions, 
the ones with the most votes go to the top of the screen. And I have I've been ad advised that um, I don't have to go to the top of the screen, but I have been advised that if I don't, there can be a revolution. <laughs> so I'm going to, as a prudent fellow, I'm going to start with the top of the screen. There's a question from Stephanie Thorson. What natural advantages to Cana do Canadians have that we can use to leverage this opportunity? And I assume this opportunity is uh, cost-effective climate policy. I'm just going to assume that that's what that opportunity is. Um, Dom? Well, I, I think a couple of things. One is we, in a strange way, our resource-based sector, our ag is we have to do, you know what I mean? That we, we, we have to do it. And I think we've got the scale so that if we, <clears throat> if we actually do something better, the, the multiplier of that is going to be multiple c compared to even other countries. And I think it's going to give us advantage. Like again, we've talked about ag food before. I, I think this is an area where we are well positioned if we do make the right investments and so forth to be a leader in it. So I just think with the, given the scale of our natural resource based into that that's that's why it surprises me that we aren't a clean tech hub globally mckinsey did a report and i've always remembered this graph because i've used it several times always noting it was from mckinsey and you took all the natural resource countries in the world on a graph and ranked them then i guess relative to um their um, education of the workforce, I believe, was the x-axis. And what was amazing was Canada ended up being sort of the place that kind of had the most educated population, coupled with sort of the highest amount of resources, so meaning that we had this great capacity to kind of take advantage of our resources because we had the brain talent <laughs> You know the knowledge, you know the the knowledgeable uh, population to do so, which I thought was uh, I always a, a great graph. You haven't seen that. No, <laughs> oh, you don't read those reports. <laughs> you don't read those reports. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have thoughts on that, or should I go to the next question? I mean, I, I just say it's capacity to innovate, and uh, and that's that's enough for me. Okay, we have a smoking hot question here from yeah. a person named Anonymous. Oh, and then Bruce jumped to the top, but we're going to go to Anonymous. What impact do geopolitical unrest have on our future growth opportunities? Geopolitical unrest, how does that affect our future growth opportunities? Do you want to? Uh, sure. I, I mean, I, I, what I, it, it's very negative because of, of protectionism is what I think mm -hmm. happens and disruption in markets. I mean, I was, when I started working in 1986, you know, the view was ca global capital markets, free trade, this is someone, Putin's signaling me <laughs> on the side. So, um, but, you know, that, that's, that is no longer the uh, basis. And GE is actually, I think, a bellwether in just terms of how, how to think about, you know, being a multinational in a world that's bec becoming less global. And I think geopolitics is, so it's, I think it's negative, very negative. Can I add something about, I would add something about commodities. So the, the, yeah. it, it's, we should never forget um, the power and the value of Canada's natural resources. I, I think there's sometimes very unhelpful <laughs> conversations in Canada, especially when we start talking about environmental issues, is that, is that there becomes a, 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 a dichotomy that we talk about the new economy and the old economy or the natural resources and, and, and better things. But we actually are blessed with tremendous, uh, tremendously rich natural resources that the world will want for a long time. And one of the ironies here is that some of that geopolitical unrest drives up those prices that helps us, right? Now, if the trade channels close down because of protectionism, that, that doesn't help us. But let's not lose sight of the power of our resources. If anybody... But, but I, I, I think uh, you should look at this in a different way, and that is... Um, you know, Canada is a small country in the overall global emissions. So, you know, we can do our bit, we can work hard, but we need the big emitting countries oh, to be effective. And if they are distracted from that, 
uh, because of global unru geopolitical unrest, then they're not going to be doing their bit to reduce emissions. Right. And we're going to have all those costs, sure. environmental turning into financial costs, here in Canada. So, so, you know, it's in our interest not only to do our best on the environment, but to have conditions so that all those other big emitters can do their best. I'll just add to the positive side of the story is that we are blessed to be in a country that on a relative basis does not suffer from a lot of these problems that these other countries are suffering from. And I just sort of say shame on us if we don't take full advantage of that and figure out how to get stuff done in a collaborative way, in a positive way. But you know, we don't suffer from so many of these other situations that we see around the world. Um, and we should use the talents that we have and the political leadership and stability that we're blessed with um, to figure it out in order how to get it done. Okay, we got some good questions. Bruce's question has got 12 votes. Germany is a strong economy with double our fuel prices and three to 10 times our elect electricity prices. Yet Canadian businesses whine about price. How do we shift these corporate attitudes? <laughs> Why don't we start with uh, Paul? Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to say that uh, um, I have a daughter who lives in Germany, and uh, in Germany, beer costs less than water. Okay, so, you know, maybe we could have some of that. <laughs> and, I mean, that's, that, that's facetious, but what I really mean is... Is that a policy out? I mean, yeah. sorry, how, how do they get that out? <laughs> I'm not sure how we can fit <laughs> this into the panel, out? but... But the reason I say that is because it's just natural that people like what they have. And if you should say, oh, well, those guys who live far away and we don't have much to do with pay a lot more, uh, you know, that's not, so, that's not so compelling. I think the way to change this is to talk about what the opportunities are, right? So we're going to have a carbon price, and it's going to do this, and it's going to unleash all this innovation. Right? And it's going to help us, uh, you know, avoid all these future costs. I think the only way that we can really uh, shift attitudes, not just corporate, but, you know, for individual citizens, is for them to understand why we're doing it and what the benefits really are. Anything else? Or I'm going to, because the next well, question is pretty good, too. I'll just <laughs> okay. say on the, on the whining, I think part of it goes back to our cost structure. So just remember, for years and years, we attracted companies here on the basis of not the lowest, cap, lowest labor market costs in the world, um, not necessarily you know, the easiest transportation, but because of our low electricity prices. That has been a point at differentiation that attracted businesses to set up what are energy intensive businesses in this country to begin with. So the whining could be that some people maybe say, OK, if that goes up, I am here because the differentiating advantage I had was low energy costs. And that's why my plant is here. So you can increase that cost three times. But now that plant might get a different advantage that you don't offer by locating somewhere else. And so I think it is a matter of how do we structurally make this transition as a country so that while we bring in the innovation, we, we don't end up moving things out that might be energy-based and have other alternatives as to where they can move while the innovation is still driving growth. Energy policy also matters, and I'm still on Bruce's point about Germany. Uh, we may see a lot more whining in Ontario by businesses about electricity prices right. than we do in BC and Manitoba and Quebec. So is it something different in the water or is it something different about the way the electricity system operates? And back to Dom's earlier point about subsidies, I mean, one can argue that a lot of policies in Ontario over the past several years uh, that were really about supporting particular types of clean power in particular ways have driven up the price of electricity in ways that are uh, a flashpoint. We're going to anonymous. <clears throat> I love this question as a macroeconomist. 
Uh, there it is. We are a risk-averse nation relative to the United States, and as Mark Carney said when he was back as in this country as governor of the Bank of Canada, as he said, business is hoarding capital. These are big ships to turn. Please address. You want to start? Sure. Uh, Mark Carney's a good friend of mine, and I've always thought he was wrong about this. Me too. Uh, I'm always nervous when uh, government officials tell CEOs how to run businesses. Me too. But that said, <laughs> but that said, I think the thing that will cause companies to invest is where they see the opportunities, right, to uh, uh, to earn uh, revenues. And so, really, I think the way to turn this big ship. Is to uh, is to really create conditions where there are opportunities for businesses to deploy their capital and uh, and and uh, and earn a good return on it, and that I think uh, you know innovation in um, in clean tech and the environment is exactly one of those those places. I would add that this is a. Uh, largely a macroeconomic phenomenon, and it's not just a Canadian phenomenon. So we have very slow growth, we have, and was, which is very common following a financial crisis, extremely common following a financial crisis. Uh, it's true in Canada, it's true in most parts of the world. We have slow growth, we have pessimistic expectations on the part of the firms, uh, and that is a classic environment in which investment sits there and does very little. So you've got to turn that around somehow, that's not easy. Uh, we're going to the next question, which is Michael Small. How will Canada's new carbon price, notice there's a singular in that question, new carbon price affect our competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the United States? Paul? Well, uh, a very good question from His Excellency, uh, our former ambassador to, uh, to Australia. And so, uh, and a, a trade expert in his own right. I think that uh, if you read the eco fiscal report on this matter, you'll see that. There's one uh, on almost everything. <laughs> you'll see that, in fact, uh, you know, trade exposed emissions intensive industries uh, vary from province to province. In most provinces, the uh, the proportion of uh, the economy is uh, that that faces those challenges is small, but uh, in provinces like um, like uh, Alberta, for example, in Saskatchewan, it's larger, up moving towards 20 percent. So I think what you have to do is you have to address those rather than say, well, that's a good reason not to price carbon. You should say, no, well, we have to address those competitiveness issues industry by industry. And that's what we talk about in Ecofiscal Report. Anything on competitiveness? Are you particularly, con tell us how, how GE is thinking about a carbon price in several parts of this country as it gets patched together and as it rises possibly above a carbon price in the United States? How are you feeling? We have always supported a carbon price. Um, yeah, but how do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> We're How do your shareholders feel? We're an innovation and a technology company. So in some ways for us, it actually helps drive innovation, drives new technology. Um, as I said earlier, um, I guess one other comment, we were talking about regulation. And you know, if you have a choice of regulation or a carbon price, there can be excellent regulation, like the type you drove, Paul. But there can also be regulation that's incredibly prescriptive, that actually hinders innovation, hinders growth. Um, can drive um, business competitiveness away. So I think we always, you know, it's always, um, I think, more um, beneficial to Canada when we are aligned in some of these areas more with the states than not. I would say it's really great for Canada when we're aligned internally before <laughs> we worry about our alignment sometimes with the U.S. Simplicity makes for more competitiveness. So I, don't, I think the, to the extent that we can make things simple and make them more homogeneous across the country, it unites us in a stronger way. It reduces the cost of doing business in Canada. And then we can manage that relative to the US or Mexico or other jurisdictions for the very point that, that uh, Paul mentioned around the costs. But I, I would say first, getting our own house as harmonious as we can, 
um, is probably one of the more important issues so that people will look at Canada and say, okay, I can figure out how to do business here. So I want to stay on this. Dom, quick question to you. You probably talk to more foreign businesses than any person alive in a short period of time. Yeah. Well, you do a fair amount of traveling. Yeah. Um, when you talk to foreign businesses, some of, some of them are in a world with carbon price, some of them are in ju jurisdictions without a carbon price. Are they talking about this? Are they worried about this? Are they worried about the carbon price differentials on the competitiveness issue? I, I would say that there, is a, there has been a shift in the last three years where people say this is the reality. This is yeah. happening. And you see it with energy company CEOs, most of them now, saying, you know, we're going to have to deal with this. Um, so I, I, that's the bigger issue about we're now going to have to, there's going to be a price and we're going to have to deal with it. Right. And we better start configuring ourselves to do that. I, th I think that, that's been uh, a, a really big positive shift that's going on. I think you have to be a Neanderthal to not, not understand that things are, are changing and not, you're not preparing your organization. I completely agree with Elise. I think if we can make it less complicated, yeah. it's more... It's more the complication of, well, how, what if I have, you know, my, because supply chains are so complicated. They don't, they don't operate in one nice geography. They, they cut across everywhere and they go back and forth several times. That's the stuff I think, that, that's why I completely agree with what Elise saying. If we can simplify it, it you know, simpli simplification uh, leads to a lot of performance improvement, more so than you might think from a price. So that's the part I would say. So there's, there's been a big shift, but if, if we could simplify it, it would, that, that's what would make life easier. Okay, I am mindful of the time, and I think I am, uh, I'm going to say three minutes until the end. Is that right? Three minutes to the end. So I'm going to give you each one minute. So if you have one minute to ride in an elevator from the ground floor to the 60th floor with whoever you want to be in the elevator with, but you're going to tell them what you want to say about growth, climate policy, competitiveness, whatever. What is your closing thought to this group in one minute or less, Paul? I guess I would say, um, you know, Carbon pricing uh, is a good step along with uh, smart regulations and other measures. Um, but to really get the full uh, efficiency benefits, you need to take an additional step related to carbon pricing. And that is, do your best to create markets. So, I mean, it's to the effect, to the extent that you could, uh, in British Columbia, uh, find the lowest cost offsets, uh, you know, wherever you were, uh, wherever they were in Canada or the U.S. Or, or North America. What we're trying to do is reduce our carbon at the lowest possible cost. And to the extent that we can have markets that give people the broadest range of opportunities to reduce carbon, that's how we're going to get those costs down. Perfect. To markets. Elise. We should take this focus uh, on reducing uh, GHG emissions and the, imp uh, the implementation of carbon pricing. Um, we should embrace it, and we should um, be seeing how we can use it to our advantage uh, to drive our companies to be competitive and to create ecosystems of small companies, large companies, and multinationals that build a whole new economy that we can export uh, around the world to drive growth in the country. Perfect. Dom. I have two guys in the elevator. <laughs> so, uh, so, but, uh, you know, this, this is a really boring point I make, but I think. For yeah, you work for Yeah, no problem. What is, um, let's use the word carbon price and not carbon tax. You ca carbon price is, it's a price. It's a, it's, we've got a, that, 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 it's a positive. I don't, this sounds like, it's, it's not a, tax is seen as a negative, this is a positive. It's about, how we reallocate resources in a well-functioning economy, it's going to lead and allow and enable innovation. And so I would see it as a, which great, we're finally pricing something we should have been pricing a long time ago. That's what it is. And now we reallocate properly. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I would say. Thank you. So my one minute pitch is that um, it's a remarkable change in this conversation in Canada and globally but in Canada over the past decade. 
Uh, ten, ten years ago, there was, I believe, no jurisdiction in this country that had a carbon price. Uh, today, we have four provinces that represent something like 80% of the economy that either have a carbon price or are in the process of developing one. We've got a fifth province, Manitoba, that has expressed its commitment to do it. Uh, we have a federal government two, months, two weeks ago that said that it was committed to stepping in and making sure that those policy gaps were filled, either by the provinces or territories or by the Fed itself. So when we, 10 years later, can get to the point where we are talking about how to recycle the revenues and what height to do the price and why do you use carbon tax versus cap and trade, um, I think that's just an enormous advance for this discussion in Canada. So I think all Canadians gain from the fact that we are now having the discussions like we are, rather than 10 years ago having far, I would say, less productive and more emotionally charged discussions. And the other thing I will say is that ecofiscal um, has been a, and it's not over yet, but it has been a blast to be doing the ecofiscal commission for the last three years. And I think the next three years might be just as much fun but one of the things that makes it so much fun is that I get to work with people like this. So I want to thank the three of you for being here today and for giving us the value of your insights. Uh, and thank you for listening and thank you for participating, sending out the tweets, sending in the questions. And uh, I don't know what happens next, but I, I hope you will just join me in thanking our three panelists. Adam. So ladies and gentlemen, good after, good evening everybody. My name is Andrew Beattie. I'm the president and executive producer of iPolitics Live. I really hope you enjoy your session this afternoon. Um, I want to thank everybody for their participation in the event. I want to thank our panelists and Chris Reagan for, for, for your contributions. The conversation was absolutely fascinating. We really and sincerely appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, there were a number of questions that were asked today. And um, many of you uh, were wondering what happens with those questions and information. Well, I will give them over to the Canadian Climate Forum to our friends on the panel so they can review them. They'll also go back to the iPolitics newsroom, so it'll become fodder for future stories as we, as we pursue this, uh, the, this line of questioning and these events uh, a little more closely in the weeks and months to come. Again, on behalf of uh, our entire team at iPolitics, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>